what's our obligation in terms of looking for a potential victim? For example, the client communicated violent intent, intent toward his landlord. Then landlord does not live on the property. He rents and so on and so on. Um, and um, the, the standard here is one of uh, what would a reasonable practitioner do? Okay, so if we know this person's the landlord, then um, it's not simply impossible to find out who the person is or how to notify them. Um, nowadays, with the landlord, you could probably go on Google or zabasearch.com uh, Zaba and find him within about 30 seconds. Um, so the, the question here is in terms of practicality, we make reasonable attempts to find this person. Um, the other piece, and this is related to um, uh, checking um, or, or asking, you know, besides hospitalization, what other options are there? Well, hospitalizing someone, whenever we have a person who threatens serious bodily harm to and they're um, a client of ours and they are diagnosable with some mental disorder, whether major or minor, we then can make the attempt to hospitalize them. That buys us time in finding the potential victim. Importantly, though, does not let us off the hook about about doing the warning. And that's one of the messages of the Ewing versus Goldstein case. Uh, we still have to follow through with our Tarasov, but we do buy ourselves some time. Okay, so hospitalization. Another option, of course, is to um, ask for a welfare check of the person who is potentially violent. Be aware, though, that that, just like hospitalization, does not necessarily fulfill our obligation. Okay? So we have an obligation to find the potential victim. When they're identifiable, we have to take reasonable steps. So if we document that we attempted to find their phone number, we attempted to locate them, for example, on the web, they were not locatable. We obviously um, we're going to ask the um, uh, the yeah. client of a, a bunch of questions, including where is the the potential victim. Sometimes the clients will not tell us. They sometimes will not know. But if we ask the question, we should document that we attempted to address that particular avenue of gaining information. Okay. So um, do is ask the uh, um, client first off, okay, so you're in intending to hurt um, Mr. Land. Now, what's a welfare check? A welfare check is when we call the police and ask them to check on the welfare of someone at a particular address. We don't have to disclose our relationship to them. We, don't, we can say we're concerned about the person's safety. Um, but a welfare check is something that gets used, I wouldn't say necessarily often, but with some regularity. For example, when we have clients who we think are suicidal, um, they're being cagey with us, or they've disappeared and we're concerned about something having happened to them, so we can, in fact, do that when we believe that there is potentially a life at risk. Should the police be contacted? Yes. We have two things that we do for a Tarasov. When we have to do a Tarasov, we make reasonable attempts to contact the intended victim, and we call the police. Those of you who um, have done Tarasovs, at times calling the police is not the most comforting of experiences um, about Three months ago, a student of mine uh, had to do a Tarasov and called the police. And the 
watched um, the sergeant uh, who was taking the message said, well, what are we supposed to do about this? And it very much depends on the jurisdiction you're in. San Francisco, for example, has a, um, a Tarasov unit. They know what they're supposed to do with Tarasovs. And so they take them, they send out usually uh, a patrol car. Um, but yeah, we absolutely have to inform the police. What and how much should we tell the potential victim? Should we advise the landlord what to do in order to protect himself? Well, two different ideas. I think the first question is something that's really crucial. There was a case in, um, uh, that got settled out of court, that involved a patient who had been uh, released from an East Bay hospital. And that particular patient threatened to hurt someone. Um, Good question as to why they were released, but we'll leave that for another time. And the, um, uh, the person who got the threat, the, the, the staff person, called the intended victim. And they called the intended victim and they said, so-and-so is saying they're going to hurt you. Okay, so they gave but it was And it was ambiguous to the extent that the professional did not disclose to the victim or the potential victim that this patient was threatening to kill the potential victim, not just hurt them. So we should be very explicit in regard because what happened in this particular case was that the, um, the, the patient or client who had made the threat um, actually attempted to kill the person who had been warned and caused them grievous bodily injury. And the person who had been warned sued the hospital and sued the professional saying, you didn't let me know that my life was at risk. You just said that I could be hurt. That's a totally different situation. Uh, so that case got settled out of court. And it, it, although it's not, um, it's not. Now, whether we should advise the landlord about what what to do to protect himself or herself is a somewhat different question. We're not experts in security. Um, you know, we're not supposed to, or nor are we required to tell people what to do. If they say, well, what do I do? Um, you can, I think one of the best things to do to, with folks is to say, well, you might want to call the police and talk to them about ways to protect yourself. Um, what kind of things you can do that are both legal and that are more likely to be effective. Um, if you are a mental health professional who has some experience with this and, um, um, and has some knowledge, we can provide that knowledge just to be sure that it's uh, kind of a reasonable word. In other words, we don't tell people, well, you should go out and get a firearm, learn how to use it, and then you see that guy coming along, you shoot him. Obviously, if we give that kind of advice, we're going to be held liable for um, probably stepping outside of the scope of our practice, among other things. Um, but to re definitely, we should be clear with the victim about the level of risk to him or her, and then we can refer saying, you know, talk to people who are experts. Give the police a call about what to do to protect yourself. If you're knowledgeable and experienced, then provide information. But a 14-year-old um, threatened to harm a 9-year-old who was with the family who was babysitting him. And the client, the, the um, therapist uh, warned the family, um, and that is the family of the 9-year-old, uh, had not communicated with the parent of the 14-year-old about the threat, and the parent of the 14-year-old got very upset. Um, from a strict, you know, kind of Tarasov perspective, and, and I'll broaden it for a, in a moment, but from a strict Tarasov perspective, there is no duty under Tarasov to tell the parent that their minor is threatening to harm a third party. Nowhere is that written anywhere, okay? It's just not there. However, it's probably good clinical judgment. And, and from an ethical perspective, because the 14-year-old is the complete legal responsibility of the parent, it makes sense to inform the parent, if at all possible. Um, and also, you know, the parent may still be very upset about that and may not want you to call the police and so on. So I think um, there still may be quite a bit of distress on the part of the parent and the 14-year-old who is threatened. But your clinician at least from my perspective, did the right thing. 
And the one place that I would uh, make a suggestion is to, to kind of as a, as a regular or pro forma aspect of doing these kinds of tariff offs, um, inform the parent of the client as well, uh, because they are legally responsible for that kid.